Minister of Health for Wellington, for Wellington Dufferin Guelph. In this role, Dr. Tannenbaum provides oversight, support, and medical expertise to staff and community partners. Prior to joining public health, Dr. Tannenbaum worked for several years as a family physician in Hamilton. He completed his residency in public health and preventative medicine at McMaster University, during which time he spent time at several health units in Southern Ontario, including WDG Public Health. Dr. Tannenbaum holds a Master of Public Health from the University of Toronto and a medical degree from McMaster University. And Dr. Tannenbaum, uh, thank you and welcome. Uh, we are looking forward to you chatting, after which you and I will uh, we'll go through some of the questions uh, parents and guardians submitted here this evening. Thank you very much, Danny, and thank you everyone for making the time to be here this evening. We have about an hour together, and I really appreciate the chance for me to speak with you about some of the things that are happening around children's vaccination given that we are at a very exciting time in our COVID response and our vaccine rollout. I know that many of you are taking time away from family commitments or other activities you'd rather be doing. And that it's very important to us and very special to us that you're making the time for us to speak with you right now. We do wanna make sure that this is worth your while. And I am hoping that we'll be able to answer questions you may have about the children's vaccine that we are gonna be rolling out in our community over the coming weeks and months. So again, thank you for being here this evening. And hopefully this presentation is helpful and answers questions that you may have. So this is really just our goals for the evening. Um, first of all, I'm gonna speak with you about the rollout for the COVID-19 vaccine, specifically for the five to 11 year olds and help contextualize it in our broader COVID-19 vaccine rollout, which we've been doing for the better part of a year now. As well, and importantly, I'm gonna be speaking to questions that people have submitted in advance of the presentation, answering questions that we know that you have and we know are on your minds and the minds of others in our community. We wanna make sure recognizing that you have questions, that you have good answers, and we want to provide you with reliable and trustworthy information. As your local public health unit, we see it as our responsibility to make sure you understand what's going on in your community, that you have you know, the ability to trust the interventions and things that we're recommending for you right now. And especially given the importance of immunization and vaccines, we wanna make sure that you feel confident and comfortable with what we're gonna be offering, recommending to you and those in your family going forward. So I'm gonna begin by talking a little bit about the benefits and the importance of vaccinating children, in particular those between five and 11 who are now eligible for the vaccine. Some people have been asking why it is so important that we do immunize children and offer them the vaccine. Because oftentimes when we think about COVID-19, we think of it as a disease that affects older people. However, we in public health know that children in our community have borne a significant burden and experienced a lot of harm as a consequence of the pandemic. And that harm and that burden often goes unrecognized. We know that some children in our community have been affected with COVID-19. And while many of those who are children who become uh, infected with COVID-19 do well, some of them unfortunately develop complications, require hospitalization, or develop things like the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, MISC, or long COVID, which are both complications of the infection. Many children in our community over the past two years have had to isolate due to COVID-19 exposures. And as a consequence, have had to miss school, miss recreational activities, miss enjoyable get-togethers, and avoid seeing friends or family. Over the course of the pandemic, children in our community haven't really been able to engage in the kinds of activities that are so important to their social and emotional development at those critical ages. However, we know that getting vaccinated will help children return to more normal lives going forward. The vaccine has a number of benefits, which you can see on the slide that you have in front of you. First off, it protects them from becoming infected or ill with COVID-19, and it protects them from some of those concerning complications like MISC or long COVID, which can be devastating for some children and families. It also protects those around them because if a child doesn't get infected, they're not able to pass the virus that causes COVID-19 onto others, including those around them who may be older or more vulnerable to the impacts of COVID-19. As well as a consequence of these benefits, getting vaccinated means that children will have fewer disruptions in their school life, in other activities and be able to engage with family and friends around them. In short, getting vaccinated at a community level will allow kids to be kids again and allow us to move from where we are now to the next phase of our community's well-being after the pandemic winds down down the road. You may have heard a lot about the vaccine that is now recommended and approved for children age 5 to 11. And fortunately, we have a vaccine to offer them that is both highly effective and highly safe when it comes to COVID-19. The way this vaccine works is that it trains the body's immune system to be able to recognize COVID-19 virus if it ever encounters it in the real world. Essentially, the vaccine contains a molecule called mRNA, and that mRNA molecule, which is in the vaccine, 
allows the cells in your body to be able to essentially build a piece of the virus that it can use to learn what the virus looks like. It allows it to recognize those features of the virus that would be there if the real virus were ever in someone's body. It helps build that immune memory to mobilize a strong response if the infection ever were to occur in real life. The vaccine itself does not contain the virus, doesn't contain anything that could become a virus or become a whole virus particle. Nothing in there is alive and the vaccine cannot make the person who receives it infected with COVID-19. Additionally, after your body goes through the process of building that little piece, learning what COVID-19 looks like and having that immunity begin to be established, the mRNA in the vaccine essentially breaks down, it degrades. It doesn't stick around in the body for a length of time. It just stays around long enough for the body to be able to learn what COVID-19 looks like. And it's your body's memory that sticks around in case the real virus is ever encountered later on in life. You may have heard that the children's vaccine that was recently approved has a lower dose than the vaccine that was approved by, uh, for, for adults earlier in the pandemic response. It's correct that the uh, vaccine that was approved for ages five to 11 contains a pediatric dose, which is 10 micrograms of the actual product in the vaccine. And that's one third of the dose uh, that's present in the vaccine for ages 12 and up. We know that based upon the clinical trials that were done in advance of the approval of this vaccine, that you don't need as high a dose for the children receiving it. The, the clinical trial showed that at this dose, the vaccine was still 91% effective at preventing COVID-19. Kids don't need the same dose as adults because their immune systems are very strong, they respond very well, and they're able to build that important immunity based upon the slower dose. We do wanna emphasize that this is a two dose vaccine and it is important for children who are receiving their first dose to also receive their second dose. And that's recommended to be at an interval of eight weeks following the first dose. You may have heard about different intervals between the first and second dose, but our best vaccine experts at a body called NASI federally, they recommend that the best gap between first and second dose is eight weeks. First off, because we believe based upon emerging science that a longer interval between the first and second dose will lead to a stronger, more robust, longer lasting immune response. And secondly, there is some emerging data to suggest that some of the things that might concern us about vaccines, like a possible risk of myocarditis, is a lower risk if the first and second dose are spaced out by a greater interval. So both of those are very good reasons to get the first and second dose at an interval of eight weeks apart. I wanna also emphasize that vaccines in Canada are only approved by Health Canada after they've gone through rigorous trials that show the vaccines are both effective and safe. And these trials happen in multiple phases after the vaccines developed. And they first begin with a small number of people to look at some early questions about safety and effectiveness, and then gradually move through different phases of trial, eventually bringing in more and more participants to make sure that we are very confident that before the vaccine is approved and rolled out, that we have looked to make sure it is broadly effective and broadly safe. We want to make sure we're only offering something that we have confidence in. We know that the vaccines that were approved recently for five to 11 year olds, uh, it was shown in a trial that included thousands of children. And while some of those children had normal vaccine reactions, things like sore shoulders or arms or fevers after getting the vaccine, fortunately the trial did not show any serious side effects after receiving the vaccine. That's very important for you to know because of course, I'm sure you're thinking about the safety of these vaccines as a key consideration in your decision going forward. We also have the benefit of learning from our real world experience over the past year, rolling out a very similar vaccine to adolescents and adults, ages 12 and up, and worldwide, there have been millions of mRNA vaccine doses between the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine. We have had incredible uptake around the world, and we have learned a lot that gives us confidence that these vaccines are highly, highly effective and also very, very safe. So we can build this children's vaccine program off of what we have learned from adults, which gives us great confidence in the, in the fact that these are the right vaccines to be offering to people in our community. As well, even after a vaccine is approved and rolled out and offered to people in our community, we continue to look for any possible reasons to be concerned about vaccine safety. We monitor for any vaccine safety concerns after the vaccine is approved, in addition to all the work that happens before a vaccine is approved. 
If any side effects or concerning features after immunization are discovered or they emerge, we have a system in place that is able to rapidly identify these concerns through a strong vaccine safety surveillance system that involves multiple levels of government and healthcare providers all across Ontario and Canada. Essentially, if someone has any one of a number of side effects, including things that are relatively mild after immunization, these events, if they are uh, shared with a healthcare provider, they get reported to us in public health. And essentially, not only do we give our recommendations in response to that event, but we forward that information on to our provincial and federal counterparts, where they collate reams and reams of data and look for any patterns that could be pointing in the direction of a reason to be concerned about a vaccine. They've been doing that for you know, the past year in the context of adult vaccines. They've been doing that for all the other vaccines we've offered for years and decades before the COVID-19 pandemic. And we would still put the system in place for the child's vaccine that we're rolling out now. And if ever there were a reason that we had to be concerned about the safety of a vaccine, we would know that very quickly. We would be able to find out what the concern is we will we'll be able to make any changes in our recommendations or changes in what we're offering as a consequence of that. We do always, always continue to monitor the vaccine throughout the rollout to make sure we continue to have confidence that it is effective and safe. Within our community, we're gonna be offering the vaccine to those, between five and, uh, to those between ages five and 11 across all of Wellington, Dufferin and Guelph. We know that that age group in our community is about 23 and a half thousand people who up until now, unfortunately, have not been able to be immunized. And that's actually been one of our biggest populations in our community that has gone unimmunized because up until now, there hasn't been an approved vaccine product for them. Now that we have an approved product that we know is effective and safe, we can begin offering that to people in our community. Our overall goal is to get 90% of those who are eligible immunized with two doses of vaccine. We know that two doses is very important and high levels of coverage is very important to protecting people in our community. And for our immediate goal, we want to at least hit 70%, recognizing that it will be a bit of a longer term journey, get to those last 20 or 30% and overcoming some of the hesitancy that's going to exist, which will be important work that we do, but will take some time. Within our community, of course, you can break it down across our different geographies. And we know that you know, people are gonna be thinking about the risk within their community, we share data on our public health dashboard that shows not just case rates, but immunization coverage across all of Wellington, Dufferin, and Guelph. And we do want to see all parts of our community have high levels of uptake, high levels of coverage, high levels of protection, that we can make sure we're improving safety across all of our community and getting all of our community out of the pandemic together. Even just in the past couple of weeks since the vaccine first became available and people began offering it to children. Since that point, we've had more than 28% of the eligible population either receive their vaccine or be confirmed to have an appointment to receive the vaccine sometime soon, which is incredible. We've seen incredible response and interest from those in our community. And so far we've given over 2,400 vaccine doses in WDG in this age group. That's incredible progress in a short period of time. We know there's incredible amounts of work ahead of us to get more and more doses out to those who are willing to receive them. But we are seeing people come forward who want to get the vaccine and we are really encouraged to be able to offer them and to have such high up uptake off the bat. For those who are coming to uh, be immunized, there are a number of ways that people can get the vaccine in our clinics. One of the key ways is that we have what we call hub clinics in some of our larger areas. You see, for example, a picture of one of, our, one of our hub clinics in the background where we have people coming in, we have multiple people getting multiple vaccines from multiple providers in one convenient place within our community. Within Guelph, we have a clinic that we run at Stone Road Mall, which is run in partnership with the Guelph Family Health Team. In Fergus, we have a clinic run out of Center Wellington Community Sportsplex. And in Orangeville, we have our Alder Street Community Center. All of these are our hub clinics where we offer many of our vaccine doses, and they are sites where you will be able to access the vaccine if you choose to. On top of that, we'll also be having mobile clinics, which we'll be using to offer vaccine in some of our smaller communities and smaller municipalities. As well, building upon the initial work, we're going to be running pop-up clinics to provide some vaccine outreach in areas of greater need or in areas where we've had lower or slower uptake. 
We have you know, schools, for example, in neighborhoods with lower vaccination rates. And we've been using schools as sites where we've been running clinics out of, be able to make sure people can access those vaccines at a place that's familiar and a place that's convenient. As well, knowing that not every child is you know, going to have the greatest comfort in some of these hub clinics or mobile clinics. We also have specialty clinics that we are running for children who have challenges with some of the mass clinic sites. And these are accessible. They're held at our PHU office locations in Guelph, Orangeville, and Fergus. And they are available for those children who will be best served in that model. As well, we've been working closely with congregate settings in our community that uh, serve or that serve children or where children live. And we also have been working closely with our children's treatment centers to make sure that across all different sectors in our community, including those who are most vulnerable, we are offering the vaccine, making it easy, making it accessible, and trying to promote uptake, recognizing the dramatically positive impact vaccination can have. We know that oftentimes children and parents are nervous about getting immunized. And I want to just say that's a very normal concern to have. We know that the idea of getting a needle doesn't strike everyone as a very exciting or pleasant thing. And we know that for children who are going to be coming to vaccine clinics in the coming days and weeks, many of them may be worried right now or have questions or concerns. And as a parent or family member, you may be thinking about how best to help prepare your child or the child in your family to get the vaccine. We know there are some really good evidence-based ways to help prepare children to get the vaccine, to help reduce vaccine-related pain and anxiety. What you see on the slide here is a little cutout from what we call a CARD system, C-A-R-D, and that stands for comfort, ask, relax, and distract. Essentially, each of those words reflects things that healthcare providers can do when they provide an immunization. And they also refer to things that you can do as a parent or guardian or family member or friend of a child to help them get ready for the vaccine appointment. You can think about ways to make them comfortable. Think about strategies that work for your child to make sure that they feel at ease in advance of the vaccine appointment. Think about questions that you wanna ask and make sure that if you have those questions, you write them down, you ask your doctor or nurse practitioner or whoever's involved, ask us in public health. Make sure that you have a chance to have your questions answered so that you feel and your child feels as prepared as possible for the actual immunization day. As well, there are some great relaxation techniques that you can use in advance or during the vaccine appointment to help stay calm. And finally, there are some distraction techniques, fidget toys and other things that you can do to keep a child's attention away from the fact that they're getting a needle and onto more pleasant things. And we actually have distraction techniques incorporated into our clinic processes so that we can help provide more pleasant and less, you know, less challenging experience for children getting the vaccine. This approach is evidence-based and there are things that you can do as a parent or a guardian or family or friend also that align with these comfort, ask, relax, and distract headings to help the child who you know get ready for the vaccine appointment. Again, there are some tips, some concrete things that you can think about to help get ready across all of those categories, comfort, ask, relax, and distract in advance of a vaccine appointment. And I wanna let you know that in addition to the slides you're seeing now, we have a number of resources on our website, wdgpublichealth.ca, that align with this CARD approach that you can use to help prepare for your child or the child who you know's vaccine appointment. As well, we know that in the context where we are right now, there's a lot of information that you're receiving and trying to make sense of around immunizations in general, COVID-19 vaccines in general, and specifically the COVID-19 vaccine that was approved for children five to 11. And we've learned from our experience in the adult vaccine rollout that there's a lot of information out there for vaccines that is good and credible and reliable. And there's some information out there as well that is less reliable and not as evidence-based. We always try to talk about the importance of looking online for good information, evidence that is trustworthy, evidence that is actually coming from a good source and that you can have faith reflects the best data that we have and reflects the truth about vaccines and about COVID-19. And as you're looking for information online, which we encourage you to do, there are some really straightforward and simple questions that you can and should ask about the information you're reading to help assess whether it's credible or trustworthy, whether or not you should believe it, or whether you should go somewhere else for your information. First off, think about if you're reading something online, who's written it? Who are the authors? Do we know who they are? The people who have written it, are they experts in the topic area of vaccines or COVID-19? What are their credentials? 
Do they have background that makes sense for their, the topic they're covering? And essentially, are they an expert who you can have faith in? As well, think about who the audience is, who this information is being written for. And is it being written in a way that makes sense for you as someone who's reading it? Ask yourself what the purpose is of the information being shared. Why is it being shared? Is it meant for public consumption? Is it research? Is it more specialized that requires some interpretation? Is it meant to provide news? Is it meant for information? Is it meant as a joke? Is it meant as a meme? Ask yourself what the purpose of the information is and really look for those sources that are meant for you know, general Qs and As from a reliable source. Look at who the source is, ask if they're reputable, ask if it comes from a government website or website of a university or some other credible non-biased website. If the citing studies are trying to point to evidence, is that evidence coming from peer-reviewed journals? Is it coming from expert bodies who are making recommendations? Is it coming from a place that really is drawing from good data and good evidence that we have about the vaccines? A good easy tip is to look for the website, the actual link that you're using, and if it ends in a, in a .edu or a .gov, that's a good sign that it's coming from an educational institution or a government institution, and that it therefore is trustworthy and has jumped through those hoops to make sure that the information there is of a certain quality. Finally, look at the actual currency of the source. Is this recent information? Is the information that's there not just accurate, but accurate with the latest data we have, the latest recommendations that are being made? Is it up to date? Because of course, things, when it comes to COVID-19, information, recommendations, evidence, it changes very rapidly. Week to week, things are constantly coming out and being published. And in public health, we are rapidly adapting to that evolving data and making decisions based upon that evolving evidence base. So please look for current information, look for when it was last updated. And you, you try to find things that are updated recently and are reflecting recent developments in science. Of course, a very good place to start is to start with our website, wdgpublichealth.ca. We have a number of uh, web pages that speak to COVID-19 vaccines, including a specialized page for the children's vaccine for those aged five to 11, where we have a lot of information, including a, a robust questions and answers section, where hopefully many of your questions that you may have will be answered. Finally, of course, for more information, as I mentioned, we do have a lot of information on our website. This includes not just information about the vaccine and questions and answers related to that, but also information about the process we're using to roll out the vaccine and our vaccine plans, as well as concretely how to book an appointment, how to get that vaccine, and what to do in advance of that appointment. We know that people are looking for ways to make getting a vaccine simple and straightforward. And we're trying to make sure we're providing clear and current and easy information so that the vaccination experience is not any more of an obstacle for you and your family than it has to be. So please do go to our website and specifically go to wdgpublichealth.ca slash vaccine dash kids, which should be your first stop for good information about the vaccine and how to access it within our community. Finally, I know that we have a number of questions that we've heard from you about. We know that a number of them have been submitted and they've been great questions. And I'm gonna pass it back to Danny to go through some of the questions we've received in advance and hopefully you get lots of helpful answers from us this evening. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Tannenbaum. And uh, folks, if you if you join us a few minutes late, I do want to point out we did have uh, we did have a lot of questions. Uh, I think more than fifty in the end. Uh, so if you don't see your exact question, it's because we took uh, several similar questions and tried to compile that into 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 one uh, general question to make sure everybody uh, got as many answers as possible. Uh, there are lots of ways to reach us. So if we don't get to your question tonight, if you need more information, uh, we're on social media, we have a website, we have a call center. There are lots of great ways uh, to get a hold of us and we would encourage you to do that if uh, we're not able to get to your question. But we won't uh, we won't delay that any longer because we are gonna try and get through as many of these as possible. Dr. Tannenbaum, are you ready? I'm ready, thank you, Dan. Perfect, okay. I want to start, I want to talk a little bit, you touched a little bit about this, um, but I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the difference between the pediatric uh, vaccine and, and that given to adults. Absolutely. So I, I did mention this a little bit earlier, but essentially the vaccine that was approved for children 5 to 11 is an mRNA vaccine made by Pfizer and BioNTech. It's actually quite similar in many ways to a, a vaccine that was approved about a year ago for adults, initially for 16 and up, then 12 and up which was also an mRNA vaccine. 
Both of those vaccines are very similar. They contain a very similar set of ingredients and they contain the same sort of mRNA fragment that helps your body learn how to respond to COVID-19 if it ever encounters it in the real world. The key difference between the adult vaccine and the vaccine for children is that it does contain a lower dose of that mRNA. And the key reason for that is we know children have really strong immune systems that are able to respond really well to vaccines. And so they don't need as high a dose of that component to have an effective immune response. We know that it, there's an efficacy of 91% with this vaccine based upon the trials. And that's a really, really good number and certainly comparable to what we saw with the adult vaccines at a higher dose. Great, and a couple of, a couple of questions uh, came in around the idea of uh, the 11, 12, uh, uh, that kind of age transition. So uh, can you talk a little bit about how we base that decision on, uh, on, on weight or on age? Um, and specifically, you know, if we've got a, a large 11 year old, a small 12 year old, if you've got someone who's 11 turning 12, can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. So I can just say off the bat that uh, the way that we offer vaccines and approve and recommend vaccines is based upon age as opposed to being based upon weight. There are some medications, for example, that children may receive where they receive a dose based upon their weight or their size because that's what's needed for that medication to work. Vaccines are a little bit different and essentially they contain a very, very, very small amount of an ingredient that allows the body to recognize the virus if it ever encounters it later on. And that amount that it needs to recognize based upon a child's immune system or an adult's immune system, which isn't so much an issue of their weight, it's an issue of their age. Now we know that the adult vaccine, it's been studied, um, you know, first it was approved for age 16 and up based upon the clinical trials that were done. There were further clinical trials for people age 12 and up, and that was why we expanded it down to age 12. The children's vaccine was specifically studied in the population of children age five to 11. And that's why this is the vaccine we're recommending for that age group. Right. I want to stick with 11 and 12 year olds uh, just for a moment. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about that idea of 11 turning 12. Now we've talked about the, um, the, uh, the eight week period between doses. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the effect of, uh, I, I take my son, my daughter, who is 11, they receive a pediatric dose. Four weeks later, they turn 12. Four weeks after that, should they get an adult dose? What is the effect of that? Do we still consider them vaccinated? Uh, is that an effective treatment? Is it safe? So can you talk a little bit about what would happen in that 11-12 group if, if they were to receive uh, let's say their first dose as a pediatric and their second as an adult dose? Absolutely. And this is where some of those abstract ideas about ages and different vaccines really hit the road. Because of course, if you're 11 today and you turn 12 tomorrow, it's not as though you transform from a child to an adult overnight. Of course, you're just one day older. And that's really just a, a boundary between two ages that we define a bit arbitrarily. Certainly, if you have an 11 year old in your family and they're eligible for a vaccine right now, go out, book their appointment for their first dose and they'll be recommended the vaccine that is offered for ages five to 11. In general, our approach is that a child or adolescent or adult is recommended the vaccine based upon the age they are at the day they come to get their vaccine dose. For someone who gets their first dose when they're 11 years old, then they turn 12. They can actually receive the 12 up vaccine for their second dose. So they can get a different vaccine between first and second dose because they cross that age threshold. We know that we have every, every confidence that getting that mixed dose schedule will be effective. They're getting the dose that's recommended to them at each age, and that's a totally appropriate. And that is certainly gonna be a complete vaccine series. Both doses will be valid, and that child will be considered fully immunized after getting that second dose. If a child or family really, really wants to get the same vaccine for both first and second dose, and they've gotten their first dose with the child's vaccine, they can request to get a second dose with the same vaccine just to, in order to complete that series with two doses of the same thing, if that's important to them. That would also be considered valid. And that is something we're offering as an option. What I will say though, in general, is that for those just on the cusp of 11 and 12, I have every confidence that either vaccine is really fine, safe, effective, and appropriate. I talked about how we have one vaccine for this age group 
and one for that age group. But for those just on the cusp, it really is that transition period. And while we have an approach that we're rolling out in our community, it isn't a huge difference between which vaccine you get. And this is uh, was not a submitted question, but just in response, I would just want to uh, ask an editorial question here. Uh, we we would generally encourage folks to get the vaccine, uh, whether it's them, whether it's their children, as quickly as they're able to, rather than waiting to sort of complete two series. You know, with those eleven year olds, we we prefer they get a shot as soon as possible. I would certainly agree with that, Danny. So if you have, for example, someone in your family who's currently eleven turning 12 soon and you're asking yourself, should I get them their first dose now while they're 11 or should I wait until they turn 12 and then get them the uh, bigger dose, adult dose for both dose and one, two, uh, dose one and two? We would certainly say strongly that it is more important to get a dose sooner. And again, for those just in the cusp of 11 and 12, both vaccine products we fully expect and, and see in the data would be effective. And getting a dose sooner and getting that protection started sooner is the most important thing that we'd recommend based on. Right. I want to turn now to the the other cusp, the, the sort of younger transition age. Uh, and I know as a, as a dad of a four-year-old, I know there are a number of, of folks who have uh, uh, kids in the sort of 2017 birth year. Um, can you talk a little bit about what we see sort of in the tea leaves moving forward and whether we think uh, as we roll over into the new year, whether those four-year-olds will be eligible by their birth year starting in January, or whether uh, we may um, we may see some sort of staggered, whether that's sort of the month of the birthday or whether we see them kind of go in stages, uh, just how, how you're seeing the kind of road ahead for those four-year-olds turning five. That's a really important question the one we've gotten a bunch of times. And uh, in general, our approach with the vaccine rollout, at least over the past several months, has been that at the low end of the age eligibility, we look at the year you were born as being what determines your eligibility as opposed to your exact age. So for example, before we had the vaccine for ages 5 to 11, 11 year olds who are turning 12 this year were able to receive their vaccine. We were able to go a little bit off the young edge just to make sure that we were offering it to people who, for example, are all sharing a class together, recognizing that treating people in that cohort style help to get protection up in some of the settings where students gather, for example, in schools. And now that we have a child's vaccine going down to age five, people who are currently four years old and turning five before the end of this calendar year, meaning they were born in 2016, they are eligible even if they're not five years old yet. Now, Danny, you asked about 2017 and thinking about people who, for example, are turning five next year. Now, we don't know yet what the province is going to uh, announce on that front. They're going to make a decision very soon about eligibility for that 2017 birth cohort. And we are going to be aligning with the provincial approach on that front. And we expect to hear from them very shortly on that approach. Great. Um, I want to shift now to... Um proof of vaccination, mandatory vaccination for attendance at various things, the vaccine passport, and talk a little bit about how we see that rolling out uh, into this younger group. So uh, we had quite a number of questions on this. It's a really good question. Um, we had a number of parents ask, will the vaccine become mandatory for children to attend school? Uh, and if, if yes or no, what about to do other activities like sports, other groups? Um, and if we think that that's going to happen, do we have a sense of when that will start to take place? That's a really important question, especially given the context for, for adults and things like vaccine mandates and vaccine certificates being a part of the, man, the, the management of the pandemic over recent months. What I can say is that getting the COVID-19 vaccine, whether you are uh, age 5 to 11 or whether you're above age 12, it is not required for school. It is not one of the school required vaccines. And while we strongly, strongly recommend getting vaccinated, it is not something that you must do to attend school. When it comes to vaccine certificates and things like going to restaurants or other settings where proof of vaccination is required, we do look to the province. And right now, the latest word is that people under age 12 will not be in scope for the vaccine certificates or proof of vaccination requirements. We know, especially early on, it is really important to work with children, with parents, with families, to make sure that we are giving them good information, building confidence, and using that confidence and, and persuasion to get people vaccinated. 
we know that it's going to take some time to get people vaccinated in our community and that people have questions and it will be a while before we get to those really high levels of immunity and coverage among ages 5 to 11. And we are really working now on a persuasion approach for those who are thinking about getting vaccinated. And just uh, uh, follow along with that, um, can you talk a little bit about um, our case management process and how being vaccinated uh, in this group would impact um, if if that child is a is a contact of a case in their school and how those two things will will diverge for the vaccinated and the unvaccinated students? So I'll just begin by talking about um, adolescents age 12 and up who are sometimes in grade school or sometimes in secondary school. Of course, for most of the pandemic, the school year has been very disrupted. Schools have been closed at various points in time. And even when schools have been open, if there was a case in a particular class, everyone in that class was sent home to isolate because they were a contact of that case. And we want to make sure that they were being tested for COVID-19 and staying home in case they became ill. Once we were able to begin offering vaccines to people aged 12 and up who are going to be students often in schools, because we have confidence in the protection that those vaccines offer, we actually changed our approach on public health. We began to say that if you were fully vaccinated and you were in a class with someone who was a case, then as long as you are feeling well, you can stay in school. You can keep going into class. You still should get tested. But as long as you're feeling well, you can stay, you can keep getting your education. And of course, for that child, it means they're continuing to, continuing to learn. And for their family, it means they don't have to make arrangements for someone to be looking after that, that adolescent or child. It makes, you know, it, it causes fewer disruptions. And it means that uh, people in that age group are going to have a really important social and emotional learning experience in the school setting. Of course, with 5 to 11 year olds who are now going to be eligible for the vaccine, once they get their first and second dose, and once two weeks have passed from dose number two, they're also going to be, they're also going to be considered fully immunized. So that means if you have a five-year-old in your family and they have, they have got that full immunization status and someone in their class has COVID, they can keep going to school because they have strong protection. They still need to get tested, but they can keep going to school as long as they're feeling well. And of course, that has implications for that child. That has implications for their whole family. And that's really important to making sure that people are able to keep learning and keep developing during the pandemic. Um, we, so we talked a little bit earlier about, about that, that, uh, that interdose interval of, of eight weeks. Um, a parent wanted to know um, if we, if our vaccine program is based on that recommended interval, so if folks are uh, getting that shot done over uh, the next coming days, coming weeks, they, they, they should expect, you know, in the eight week uh, window to be getting that second dose. So the eight-week interval between dose one and two is the recommended dose. It is, it is longer than the uh, dose interval that was used in the clinical trials, but that's uh, being done. The eight-week interval is being used because of expert guidance that we have from a group called NASI, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization. They are a group of experts that work across Canada, and they pull together various branches of vaccine science to really give us strong recommendations that we can use to make the most of the vaccine rollout and make sure we're doing the best job we can. What they have found is that there is emerging data showing that people who waited longer intervals between their first and second dose had better and longer lasting protection. And that's why they're recommending, the Ontario government is recommending, and we are also recommending locally in WDG, that people do get their first and second dose spaced out by eight weeks. Great. And what about, um is shortening that interval for, for extenuating circumstances, whether that's, uh, you know, we, we were, uh, we had some hotspots designated uh, earlier in the pandemic or uh, folks who may be immunocompromised, um, would those folks be able to uh, be vaccinated sooner or will we look to vaccinate everybody along that eight week timeline? So our general approach would be to recommend for everyone an eight week interval between dose one and dose two, and that would apply regardless of whether you're a very healthy child, whether you're a child with you know, medical conditions, no matter who you are, an eight week interval is going to be what's recommended based upon the science that we have right now. Now, parents and families and children can choose to receive their second dose earlier if they want to. We do recommend that eight weeks is best, but if you choose to receive it earlier, you can. The, the implication of that is that 
there may be, you, know, you may not be getting the optimal protection from the vaccine because you know the, the optimal protection happens when you space them out by eight weeks or so. And also I mentioned earlier that there is this concern in principle about a complication called myocarditis and pericarditis, which is something that we've seen rarely with the adult vaccines. It is not something that we've seen with the child vaccines, but it's something that we are very alert to the possibility of. And NASI has recommended that the risk of that seems to be lower when the first and second dose are spaced out by a larger interval. So both of those factors go into why we're recommending an eight week interval, but people can choose to receive at a shorter interval with informed consent. Great. Kim, uh, I'd like to switch gears now and talk a bit about co-administration. And for folks uh, on the line, all co-administration means uh, is that you're getting another vaccine, so like your flu shot, for example, uh, either at the same time or very close to when you would receive your COVID vaccination. So uh, we had a question, does my child need to wait to receive the COVID-19 if they were recently immunized with another vaccine? And this person said specifically the flu shot. That's actually a very uh, salient question, especially given the timing of this and the fact that the flu campaign in our community is still ongoing. And that it's also very important for children who are in ages five to 11 to also get their flu shot. I'll just add in as well that over the past year, given you know, disruptions in school, disruptions in access to primary healthcare, going to family doctor's offices, et cetera, people are often behind on other vaccines and have been spending the fall catching up on things like meningitis vaccines or tetanus vaccines or other things that they were overdue on. So what we know about the COVID-19 and other vaccines, you may have heard that there is a recommendation that you space out the COVID-19 vaccine from other vaccines by a period of two weeks. And that was one of the recommendations that was made by NACI, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization. The reason that they recommended that is not because getting vaccines together or getting vaccines near one another will lead to any safety concerns, nor is it because we have any concerns that getting them close together will make one or both of the vaccines less effective. The reason that they've said in general vaccines should be spaced out is because if there were, for example, a side effect, if someone got swelling in their arm after getting the vaccines, then having the vaccine spaced out helps us in public health understand which vaccine might have caused that. Whenever we have a side effect reported to us, we actually do an investigation to understand, you know, did the vaccine cause this? How did it cause this? Are there any implications for future doses of the same vaccine? We do an investigation whenever we receive those reports. And spacing the vaccines out does make our investigations easier and more straightforward. However, I want to acknowledge that that, you know, the, the making our investigations easier component has to be weighed against the imperative to make sure the students, children in our community are fully immunized for all the vaccine preventable diseases that can cause illness. And we do want to make sure people aren't waiting to get caught up in other vaccines that they need. So we are saying certainly that it's best to be spaced them out just for our benefit. But if you recently had a flu shot and you're not eligible for your COVID shot, do go out and get it as soon as you can. And, and from a, from a uh, physiological perspective, um, a child who maybe over the course of the fall has done their, uh, their age four, uh, their needles, they've had the flu shot. Now parents are thinking about a COVID shot. Um, you know, that's a lot of shots for a four-year-old, you know, certainly from a, a mental health, you know, uh, you know, lots of kids are, uh, are not predisposed or disposed to enjoying uh, getting a shot. So from a, from a physical perspective, um, can you can you speak to the safety of, of getting a number of shots over the fall and then maybe not not to delve too deeply, but just touch on um, may, maybe a little bit about how parents and caregivers can think about the sort of mental aspect uh, for kids getting their shot. Absolutely. So I'll first just talk about the question of is it OK and is it safe and effective to get multiple vaccines together? And the short answer to that is yes. Getting multiple vaccines together is not going to overwhelm your child's immune system or even an adult's immune system. It's something that we actually often do. I, for example, have a seven-month-old in my home who has had a number of doctor's visits over the course of her uh, relatively brief life. And at many of them, she's received vaccines and typically given multiple vaccines at each of those doctor's visits. It is part of our normal practice in public health to give people multiple vaccines if they're eligible and due for multiple vaccines whenever we get the chance to offer the vaccine. So it is not a concern uh, to us from a scientific perspective to offer multiple vaccines together. And in fact, there was some scientific study that looked at adults who received the flu vaccine and the COVID vaccine near each other. And it found that there wasn't any reason to be concerned that getting them close together would lead to decreased effectiveness. 
Now, I think the second piece of your question, Danny, was the experience for the child of getting multiple needles at once. We know that given that needles are anxiety provoking, given that getting a vaccine can cause some pain, this is a valid concern and people don't want to get lots of vaccines typically. And so it's important that we think about some of those techniques that help relax people and make the immunization experience as positive as possible, recognizing that it is something that is unpleasant for some people. That's why we in our clinics are using that card system that I mentioned. And that card system is also linked to things that you can do with your child at home to help them prepare because we do wanna make it as painless and seamless as possible because we want those children who are coming for their first dose to come back for their second dose. Great. Um, I wanna switch now to the vaccine uh, itself and, and, and sort of a, a number of questions we're gonna go through here around safety, uh, around some of the reported side effects, around some of the things people may have heard around the actual, um, the actual uh, vaccine and what it does in our body. And, and so we've had a number of questions and I've kind of collapsed them into one here. Um, you know, we, we've heard a lot about the idea of herd immunity. And um, uh, I'd, like, I'd like it maybe if you could talk for a minute about, um, you know, whether it is really important to get kids vaccinated when we've sort of heard this number, you know, it could be 65%, could be 70%, could be 80% uh, to hit that herd immunity number. And we've already, we've already hit that number. We, we've, we've kind of blown past that. And, and that's sort of been a, a discussion point maybe long for the pandemic. And maybe if you can comment on that and, and, and maybe answer the question, have we hit herd immunity? And if we haven't, do you think we will? Absolutely. So just going back a step. So we know that the more and more people in our community who get vaccinated, the harder and harder it gets for COVID to spread or the harder it gets for any disease that the vaccine prevents to spread. That's why, for example, we, when we have high coverage in our community with measles vaccine, we don't really see measles coming up in our community, except for when we have cases being brought in through travel. This idea of herd immunity is the idea that if you have enough of the population immunized and protected, that will offer not just protection for them, but protection for those who are not immunized. And that's important because we know that for some people and for some vaccines, they actually can't get immunized. We have some vaccines for other infectious diseases that are live vaccines. And people who are, for example, immune compromised or who are pregnant can't always receive those vaccines safely. And it's important that we protect others around us by all getting immunized. Now we're learning with COVID-19 that even though we have a very, very effective vaccine, because COVID-19 spreads so easily, it's gonna take a very, very, very high coverage rate, a high number of people in our community to be immunized before we can get into that territory of herd immunity. It was one thing when we were early in the pandemic and we had that initial form of COVID that we were dealing with, but over the past year, we've been dealing with uh, what people may have heard of referred to as variants of concern, VOCs. First, we had the alpha variant, uh, began to crop up in uh, our communities last winter. And then the spring and summer, we of course have the Delta variant, which is highly, highly transmissible and now accounts for the vast majority of our cases. Because Delta is so easily spread, unfortunately it does mean that that herd immunity threshold is really, really, really high. And that's why it's important for people to get immunized, not just for the protection of others around them, but for their own protection. And it isn't possible in our community right now to rely on others getting immunized and to not get immunized yourself. You can't count just on others getting immunized. And unfortunately, I don't think we're gonna be living in a world where that's possible anytime soon. So we are saying in our current context, if you are eligible for the vaccine, please do get it. Great. Um, and so I wanna to touch on something um, that you kind of broached in the last question, which is, you know, we've heard through the pandemic, we've seen through the pandemic that really uh, children haven't haven't been impacted by COVID as much as older folks, especially, you know, before we had that vaccine, you know, we saw how tough COVID was on our on our seniors, for example. So I'm wondering if you could talk about, you know, this idea that maybe um, if the risk is, is quite a bit lower for children, then uh, is it really worth it? You know, if we're, may you know, if you can talk about maybe the risk benefit uh, calculation or how parents can think about that risk risk benefit of getting the vaccine versus some of these side effects we've heard about, whether it's myocarditis, pericarditis, you know, some of the other, um, some of those pieces that we've heard about kind of throughout the pandemic. So just speaking to that risk benefit assessment, so I'll begin by talking about COVID-19 and how the impacts of COVID-19 do differ by age. 
it is very fair and very true to say that if you are someone in your 80s and you get COVID-19, you were at much, much, much greater risk than someone who is in a younger age group, you know, under age 11, for example, of things like going to hospital with COVID-19 or dying of COVID-19. We saw over the course of the entire pandemic that age was a really key determinant in your risk of going to hospital, going to ICU, or dying of COVID. However, that isn't to say that being in the younger age groups is fully protective. We know that people in younger age groups have still become sick with COVID-19. And in fact, as we've been able to offer vaccines to adults, we've actually seen a greater and greater fraction of our overall number of cases be in those children under age 12 who can't yet get the vaccine. We're seeing the disease shift in terms of who it affects, and it is targeting those who are not vaccinated. And that, right now, that is predominantly those who are under age 12. Now, of course, it isn't just about the infections. Infections can be mild, they can be more severe, but they can also lead to longer complications. I mentioned earlier that there is this complication called MISC, which stands for multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. Fortunately, it's rare, but it is a complication that can be quite severe. It essentially involves a person's immune system going out of regulation and causing a lot of inflammation at different points in their body. These are children who get quite sick, need to go to hospital and require really significant levels of care in order to become well again. As well, we are learning right now about the impacts of long COVID and the long-term sequelae, the long-term side effects or complications of having had an infection, even if that infection was initially quite mild. So we do want to offer protection to all children in our community who are eligible for the vaccine. And just on the question specifically of risks and benefits, I've mentioned that there are these risks, which to be clear, are not as high as the risks being faced by the oldest adults in our community. But those risks of COVID-19 are still miles and miles higher and orders of magnitude bigger and the risks of getting the vaccine. Fortunately, the vaccine is incredibly safe. And while we maintain strong vigilance to make sure that we identify and respond to any possible vaccine safety concerns, that's only because we are acting out of an abundance of caution with a very, very safe product that we have right now. Great. I wonder if you could talk a little bit, so we've talked a bit about uh, myocarditis, we've talked a bit about pericarditis. Um, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about, you know, those are obviously on, on the more serious end of of the um, uh, of the potential side effects. I wonder if you can talk about what what we're seeing both locally and what we've seen kind of now that um, the vaccine is out of trial and we're we're gathering real world data on what are the, the the common side effects. What should people? What kind of things they should expect to see as as a as a general rule. That's a great question. We know that there are some side effects of the vaccines that are common and that uh, it is worth expecting if you're getting immunized, whether you're a child, an adolescent, or an adult. We know it is very common for children to, for example, get soreness or redness or swelling at the shoulder where they got the vaccine injected. That's because the immune system is responding to the vaccine and it's building that memory, and that causes a bit of inflammation that can lead to some soreness in your arm. As well, it isn't uncommon to get a bit of a fever after getting the vaccine, to feel quite tired, to have aches or pains in your muscles. All of those things are happening as a consequence of the fact that your body's immune system is ramping up, responding to the vaccine, and building that memory to COVID-19 that it needs to work effectively. So those are things that happen that are quite common. Fortunately, they are things that are very mild. If the symptoms come up, they may last a day or two, and they're typically very, very self-limited. They don't stick around, they don't cause any problems beyond a, a simple mild annoyance. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, there are things we worry about that could be more significant. Danny, you had mentioned the myocarditis and pericarditis concern, and we haven't seen that come up in the clinical trial data that we have for this vaccine. But given that we have seen this come up with the rollout of a similar vaccine in adolescents and adults, it is something that we're looking very carefully for in children in case it crops up. And in case it's one of those things that is very rare and we don't see it right away. Essentially, myocarditis and pericarditis refer to an inflammation around the heart. People who've had it uh, after receiving the adult vaccine, they typically have a bit of chest pain or a bit of palpitations, meaning a bit of a racing heart in their chest. They'll go to the hospital, they'll get some testing and ECG, some blood work to identify that that's what they have. And then they may stay in hospital for a day or two just to be monitored as they get some medication to make them feel better. Fortunately, in those adolescents and adults, this is a, a fairly mild and self-limited thing, but it is important enough that we pay very close attention to it. And we want to know if it's happening in children, which is why we're paying very close attention to any emergent data that may come up. 
The other thing that we worry about as a significant consequence is allergic reactions to vaccines. We know, for example, what's in the, what is in the vaccine, and it's possible someone may have an allergy to a component of the vaccine. That's where we in public health work with our colleagues who are allergists or immunologists who can assess a child or assess anyone getting a vaccine to make sure that they're getting the right vaccine and that it's safe for them to receive it in whatever setting they're getting it in. Great. Um, folks, uh, we're going to go a few minutes over here because we have about five or six more questions. We want to make sure you uh, you get those answered. So we are going to go maybe till about 10 past eight, to make sure that we uh, we uh, we get everything answered that was asked. So we will, uh, uh, Dr. Campbell, we'll move into a bit of a lightning round here to make sure that uh, we get through all of these. Um, just one last question on uh, on the the, uh, the conversation, the concept around safety and side effects. Um, a number of parents, a number of caregivers, asked us the question about the uh, the implications for um, for fertility risk, uh, either boys or girls, uh, and um, and how do we know about sort of long term reproductive safety of the vaccine? That's a really important question. I know it's only gotten a lot about the adult vaccine and lesson vaccine, and it's now one where we're being asked with the child vaccine. And of course, people are concerned about, you know, their ability to have children later on if that's what they want to do in their life. What we fortunately have seen is first off with the rollout of the adult vaccine to adults and adolescents. Again, these are millions and millions of doses that are being given around the world. This is not something we have seen as a side effect or a complication in association with uh, the vaccine. I mentioned earlier that we gather data about anything that's reported to us as a side effect. We collate that data with federal and provincial partners, and again, working internationally as well. And if there is something that's happening there that is suspicious, or it's happening in a way that seems more frequent than you'd expect, or there's something unusual about it, then we call that a safety signal. We pay very close attention to that. And then we, if we need to, make changes to the rollout of our vaccine program as a consequence. There has been no safety signal around anything with regard to reproduction or reproductive organs or fertility when it comes to the mRNA vaccine that's been given to adults and adolescents. As well, I'll mention that when you think about this vaccine and what's in it and how it works, again, a little bit of mRNA is used to train your body's immune system on how to recognize COVID. It doesn't stick around very long and it's really just used for your body to build that memory. There isn't a reason for us to believe that it's plausible for that vaccine and what's in that vaccine to cause fertility concerns. Sometimes you think about what could be in a medication or in a vaccine and, and what could it cause under certain circumstances or under a, a hypothetical scenario. But based upon this vaccine and what's in it, it wouldn't make sense for that kind of thing to come up. Of course, I mentioned that we do pay very close attention to anything and we accept reports of any side effects that come in and we monitor that data very closely. But fortunately, right now, we have no reason to believe there are any safety concerns on that front. Okay. Uh, and one last question uh, just uh, around the safety conversation. Um, and this is about kids who've already had COVID. We know, we know that they have not been our largest group, but we definitely know we have had uh, children, young children, uh, contract COVID. Um, for those children who've had COVID, um, should they still get the vaccine? Um, and is a vaccine-induced immunity stronger than the natural one or, or vice versa? So I'll begin with the bottom line and say that if you or your child or someone else who's considering the vaccine has had COVID before, please still get the vaccine. You're still supposed to get two doses. And there's a really important reason for that. We do know that people who've had infection with the actual COVID-19 virus have some degree of immunity for at least some period of time. However, scientists are learning a lot more about what that immunity looks like. And it seems to be uh, very inconsistent and it seems to be that people who have different illnesses, different times and different levels of severity develop different amounts of immunity that persist for different lengths of time. For example, people who have a mild or asymptomatic infection, they may not develop very strong immunity at all. And even those who have more significant illness, we don't always know how strong their protection is. You can contrast that with the vaccines where we give someone a standardized dose and we actually have clinical trials and other data that tells us exactly how much protection they get from that vaccine. So it's a known protection versus an unknown protection. As well, for someone who has had the COVID-19 infection, we know that it is still safe to get the COVID-19 vaccine. And in fact, 
within that trial that looked at five to 11 year olds, some of those children had previously had COVID-19 infection. They still got the vaccine and they were perfectly safe to do so and they didn't have any problems as a consequence. Even if you think you have some protection from having had the infection before, getting a first and second dose of the vaccine will only add to that and it will make you even more robustly protected against COVID-19 if we ever have new variants, for example, down the road. Danny, you're on mute. Ah, uh, shoot, I had it. Um, can you just talk a little bit about the trial uh, for five to 11 year olds, uh, how big it was, and then just broadly where we are kind of globally in terms of the five to 11 vaccine. So uh, we had a question around, you know, are we the only country? Are we sort of in the first bucket? Have a number of countries done it? Just sort of how that trial progressed and sort of where we are now that we're into the real world kind of uh, process of this rollout. Absolutely. So the uh, clinical trial has actually been published. It's available online. Essentially, uh, Pfizer and BioNTech, which are the makers of the vaccine, they enrolled several thousand children ages 5 to 11. And they also did a separate trial or a, a trial that looked at people under age 5. But speaking specifically about the 5 to 11 year olds, it was several thousand children. And they you know, had some who received the vaccine, some who received what's called a placebo, which is essentially a fake vaccine. And they look at the difference between those two groups in terms of who gets COVID and see based upon that, how effective is it? And look at things like side effects to help understand safety of the vaccine. They actually used data from that trial and they also combined it and compared it with data from the adults and adolescents who got the higher dose vaccine. They saw that not, they saw that not only was there similar safety and similar efficacy, but they also had similar levels of antibodies, which are the immune uh, components of our bodies that we generate. And they saw that between those two age groups, similar levels of antibodies, which is another piece of evidence that these vaccines work very well. I will also mention that while the vaccine is just being rolled out in Canada, it is not the only country that is using this vaccine. The US, for example, is one of the first movers. They approved it uh, about a month or so ago. I understand there have now been over 3 million doses uh, delivered to five to 11 year olds. And that's really encouraging. It's really important that they get immunized as it is important that we get immunized. And other sort of advanced economies of the world are also approving and rolling this vaccine out. We do know it's gonna be important for all of the world to get the vaccine. And we do want uh, lower and middle income countries to also get this vaccine as well. And we expect that this vaccine and other vaccines that are approved will eventually be made widely available around the world. Great, um, and this one, um... Uh, now that we've started um, to vaccinate those five to 11 year olds. Uh, what about the effectiveness of the vaccine? How long, how long will this vaccine be effective? That is a question that we're gonna have, I think an evolving answer to Danny. So of course we began rolling out the adult vaccine about a year ago. And we had data based upon the clinical trials, of course, before that happened, but even then, we didn't have years and years and years of follow-up data because COVID-19 has only existed, to our knowledge, for a couple of years. It's a very new virus, and the vaccines are new products. And so, of course, people have been hearing that as we've been delivering that adult vaccine, and we've been monitoring you know, the impact of the vaccine over time and monitoring the immune response, we are just now beginning to learn about who might get waning immunity, meaning that their protection begins to taper off or come down a little bit as time passes. Now we know that people who typically have that waning immunity are typically those who are older. That's why, for example, it's the older adults in our community who are now recommended to get booster doses because of that waning immunity. But we don't know yet whether children receiving this vaccine will have waning immunity. If so, how much waning will occur? And if then, when it will occur? It's something we're gonna be learning about over time as the vaccine rolls out and as we continue to monitor the safety and effectiveness of the vaccine. It may be the case that boosters are recommended down the road, but we also know that children have very good immune systems that respond very well to vaccines. And that's something that has to be considered as you look at the data that's gonna come out. Okay, and we're down to our last couple of questions. Uh, and I wanted to give you a chance just to touch on uh, the Omicron variant, which for, if, if, if folks haven't heard about it, it's sort of the new variant that is sort of uh, landed uh, sort of on our radar over the last couple of weeks. Um, can you talk a little bit about the vaccine and what we know so far about how, uh, how our vaccines, whether that's the 5 to 11 or even the adult vaccine, how effective they are in, uh, in tackling the Omicron and specifically, um, 
uh, and uh, we'll talk about 5 to 11, but for anyone, whether they should be waiting for uh, an Omicron specific uh, formulation of the shot or an Omicron specific booster. So what I will say to begin is that if you're thinking of getting the vaccine, don't get it because of Omicron and what it may do. Get it because of Delta, which is here right now. It's causing cases right now, causing outbreaks right now, causing hospitalizations and deaths right now. That's the COVID that we have in our community. That's what we need protection against right now. And we know that these vaccines, including the adult vaccine and the children's vaccine, are going to be very highly effective against the variant that we have in our community right now. Of course, Omicron is a new variant. We're learning a lot about it. And some people have been asking whether or not the vaccines are going to work against Omicron, whether there's going to be any reduced effectiveness of the vaccines in the face of Omicron, if that becomes the dominant variant. The short answer to that question is we don't know. We're still doing a lot of scientific study to understand Omicron, understand whether vaccines respond differently to it than to Delta, which is what we have right now. But what we do know is that even if this virus variant is able to evade vaccine protection, we expect the vaccines will still offer protection, even partial protection against any variant. You might've heard of Alpha, which was the variant that we had um, in our community last winter. Delta, of course, is the variant that we have right now. But there have been two other variant of, variants of concern that we've been dealing with uh, called beta and gamma. Both of those um, were variants where we had concerns that they could escape vaccine protection. And be, that's because they have certain mutations that make it harder for the vaccine to work on them. But even with those variants, people who had the vaccine still had some protection. It is not an all or nothing measure it is still better to get vaccinated no matter what the variant is. And there are some parts of the immune system's response that we believe are, are preserved and they stay good no matter which variant of COVID you face. If there's a need for new vaccines, updated vaccines down the road because of Omicron, then we will roll those vaccines out as soon as we have them based upon recommendations we receive once they exist. We, we want to offer good protection if that's what we need to do. But until we get to that point, the number one thing to do right now is to get the current vaccine that's available right now that will protect you against the COVID variant that we have right now. And even if Omicron is good at evading vaccine protection, this vaccine will still give you a leg up against it down the road. Great. And, and very last, um, and this is for folks who have a 5 to 11 year old and maybe that's a big brother or big sister. Um, what, what do we know about what's coming down uh, the pike or those under five-year-olds? When, when, how is that, how is that trial proceeding? Uh, when can we hope for some news on vaccines on that front? So Danny, as you know, this is a question very near and dear to my heart as the uh, father of a seven-month-old in my household. Um, this is a question that doesn't have dates attached to it right now, but we do know that the vaccine manufacturers are in various stages of development, and in some cases, stages of doing clinical trials for ages under five, typically looking at ages six months to four years of age. We don't know exactly what the results of those trials are yet. We haven't seen the data. We know that what has to happen is those trials have to be completed. The manufacturers have to collate that data, put it all together, submit it to Health Canada. Health Canada has to review it. They have to make sure they're confident the vaccine is safe and effective before they approve it. And then of course, we need to actually receive that vaccine product to begin offering it. So we have a number of steps to go through before we're able to make that vaccine available if everything goes well. But I do have every confidence that we're gonna have some really big updates on that this year, just recognizing that we've moved at incredible pace with the vaccine development so far. It's a bit of a miracle that we had a vaccine available for adults within about a year of the pandemic being, uh, being set off. And you know, le less than a year after that, we had you know, this vaccine for children that was already in trials and going through approvals. Things have moved very quickly because of the incredible work being done by vaccine scientists and by regulators and by others who are looking into the recommendations for vaccines. And so I do believe, I know they're still working very hard. I do believe, and I hope that we will have something to offer those under age five in 2022. Fantastic. What a, what a, what a positive note to end on. Uh, and, and that does, folks, uh, bring us to the end of this evening's presentation. Uh, thank you so much to Dr. Tannenbaum for spending some time with us tonight and to all of you for finding uh, some time in your very busy schedule to join us and, and chat a little bit about, about vaccines. Uh, this is a, a complicated decision as, a, as any decision around uh, 
the the health of, health of our children of our little ones and so we want to obviously honor that uh, from public health and we want to make sure that you have every bit of information you need to support that uh, that good choice uh, our website is a great uh, source of information as is your primary care provider and we encourage you to really have those conversations to dig into that information that you need in the coming days and weeks so that we can get as many of our children uh, in that 5 to 11 age range vaccinated uh, and protected against what is still a very serious uh, virus. So thank you so much. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at kind of one of the future events. We hope you have uh, a, a great evening, a great uh, end to your week, and a very safe and happy holiday season. Thanks, and have a great, great night. Thank you, everyone.